What a great song. Our worship director, Aaron, sent that to me months ago and says, well, what do you think? And I said, let's do it. And for several months now, my neighbors have been hearing that song uh, quite loudly every morning. And so I hope you've enjoyed it. I sent it out in our email this past week. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to it, just click on that. And as you'll, you'll hear in the message today, that uh, having a heart of gratitude is key to our life. In fact, even as I was writing this whole message, that song was playing over and over and over. Well, again, uh, having a heart of gratitude is central to who we are as people. And just let me just say, I'm Juno, I'm the lead pastor here, and it is an honor to be able to, to share with you all this morning. And of course, you keep asking me about Ezra, my grandson, and yes, he also says hi to you. He has missed uh, seeing you every week, and that's him a, a couple days ago. And today, I want to also introduce to you, I think, our youngest child in our church, and her name is Ella Naomi. Isn't she just wonderful? David is her dad that plays bass, right? Guitar. He plays something up. They're all the same, if you ask me. <laughs> One of those things like this. Oh, anyway. Uh, and I'm assuming Courtney, they're in the back. Uh, let me just say, as a, as a grandpa of a new grandchild with a daughter that's a little sensitive, she goes, Dad, every time I bring Ezra out, people want to touch him. And she goes, I don't know where those hands have been. And so if you see little Ella out there, uh, be careful on the touch. Uh, just admire from a distance. Elijah is her older brother, and uh, they are doing great together. And so whether it's uh, Ella or our online guest, let's just give a round of applause for those who are tuning in today. And as you've heard, we are continuing our series, Summer in the Psalms. And again, the Psalms connect with so many people because they, they are such a, uh, an incredible uh, description. They, they reflect our lives and all the different feelings and emotions that, that we experience in, in life. And they are the reminder that in every season of our life, we are to go back and to, to reflect on the character of God, on God's promises, and on the presence of God. You know, the Psalms are not just a form of worship, they're, they're songs, in fact, uh, but they also serve as a way of shifting, and maybe in today's language I would use the word pivoting, because we've had to learn to pivot more and more. Uh, we, it helps us to pivot to what's most important in our life, and to be continually looking toward God, no matter what our experiences or what our feelings so let's pray. Lord, thank you for your living word, your message that points us to Jesus, your message that was written a long time ago in a culture that's different than ours, yet it speaks to our hearts and our culture today. Thanks for being a God who doesn't want to check who doesn't want us to check our emotions at the door, but you invite us to bring them into this place, this place where your presence is this place where we are a part of community. So we are thankful. We are thankful for the power you have to change our lives. We are thankful that the hope we have in you is that uh, life goes on far beyond our current realities. And so just simply thank you. And I pray that today you will open our eyes to see you more clearly. Amen. So have you ever texted somebody or, and if you know me, you've probably received a text or two. Have you called somebody? Have you emailed somebody? And have you said, no, let's, I need to talk with you, but yet no response. So you reach out again. No response. Now the term today, I think that's called ghosting, right? Now parents, okay. Men, this is sexist, I know. I've talked to way too many men whose wives never pick up the phone when they call, never respond to a text. But the reverse of that 
Ladies, I've been on the receiving end that men, when we don't pick up that phone, we're in trouble. We don't respond to that text almost immediately. It's like, where you been? I've been texting you three minutes ago, a minute ago. You haven't responded. Well, that's what David was feeling in this chapter in the Psalms. He was feeling that he was being ghosted by God. I almost made that the title, but I almost felt guilty even writing that out. Because we know God doesn't ghost us. But if we were honest, there are times when we do feel that God is absent. That he's ignoring our pleas. That we can't figure out what is going on. And again, that's what King David was doing in this psalm. King David was a guy who didn't always have his act together. And if you missed last week's sermon, you're going to want to catch that. He wasn't perfect. And yet, uh, he was King David. He was a guy that, that had earned the title, a man after God's own heart. And David asked the question that, let's be honest, that most of us have at one time or another. He asked in, in Psalms 13, verse 1, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Now, David was asking, Lord, again, are you ghosting me? Where are you? You're not letting me know what to do. Maybe you've cried out, Lord, do you hear me? This isn't easy. This isn't fair. This isn't right. Why don't you let me know something? Why don't you? Why don't you heal my parents? Why don't you restore their marriage? Why don't you heal my, my mom or my dad or my child? Or my relative, Lord, this isn't right. This isn't fair. And where are you in all this? How long will you hide your face from me? You must have, and if you haven't, let me encourage you that it is okay to ask the questions. God, why aren't you answering me? God, I need you now. I need to make a decision. I want to do what's best, but I'm clueless and I need your help. Maybe you've bargained with God. I'll do anything. I'll even be a pastor, Lord. That is not a confession. No, he was saying, don't be a pastor. No, no, that wasn't what God was saying to me. Uh, but, you know, we all bargain. We make those bargaining chips. I'll never do something again if. Just answer me, God. And again, David was an important guy. He was the king of God's people, the king of Israel. He's an important person. And yet he was feeling that God wasn't there. And as we've mentioned, you know, David had some struggles, some struggles in his own life. He was told by God, hey, you're my anointed one. Which took a guy named Saul out of the picture. Saul got mad and hunted David like an animal. And then David's son tried to take over his dad's kingdom. So don't you think there were some times, despite David blowing it, Numerous times. There were times that David had the right to question God. David was in some difficult places. And this psalm, this prayer, is written as a reflection of his heart. And again, I'm confident that every one of us, no matter what our situation is, that we have had similar prayers to our God. This psalm, again, as Pastor Ryan mentioned, uh, is a song of lament and lamenting. And, and really, over one-third of the psalms are geared toward lamenting. 
and again, lamenting, in case you didn't pick it up earlier, is, is, is when you're pleading with God. It's pleading to help you to understand. Now, you could be angry with God, which is a different emotion. But this is a lament. Is this is when you are pleading with God for clarity, when you're confused and you just want to know why. Now, as a community, at times, we, we lament together, whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's injustice in our society, whether it's things happening in the world that just make no sense at all, and we wonder why. So as a community, we lament, and then we lament individually. So again, I'm going back to, have you ever felt that God has been silent in your life? When have you pleaded with God for an answer? These are great questions for you to talk about you know, in your life group. When have you cried out, please, Lord, please, Lord, I just have to know why. And for those of you who know me, you might be thinking, oh, I know what Juno's lamented about. He's going to lament about his wife who struggled with an 11-year battle of cancer. And that really isn't what I had lamented about. I thought through this several weeks ago as I was preparing. I go, I think that's what I should say. But it's really, if I was honest, not was I, what I was lamenting. Oh, do I miss my wife? Of course. Do I, will I get some of those answers when I get to heaven? Yes. I was just grateful that 11 years earlier, she didn't die. And that we had 11 extra years. So I didn't question God about her death. Now, I did question God while I was driving around the city of Phoenix with a dying woman in my car and not a hospital would take her in. It was a little surreal, people. I could not find a place to take her. Now, if that was lamenting, maybe, but it is a major question I have, and I just had to process some of my disappointment in our medical system. So when I'm thinking about lamenting, the Lord did bring two areas to my mind. One would be during my dating years, and there were a lot of them. I seriously questioned God as to why he just didn't plop the Miss Wonderful into my life. When I was in my mid-20s, my late-20s, when I turned 30, in my early 30s. Man, and again, there were a lot of people praying for me uh, that I'd find Miss Wonderful. And if God would have answered my prayers on women who I thought I would have married or I wanted to marry, I would have had many wives. Now, if I lived in Utah, that would have been okay. But my understanding of marriage and God designed one man and one woman, that just didn't work. And yet, it was just after a couple dates, this young blonde came into my office at the university with some flowers and chocolate chip cookies. And I knew she wasn't just another date. And it was God saying, here she is, make your move. Don't overanalyze it, just go with it. And then seven months later, we were married. Yep. I still have a little mustache. Some of my friends call that, well, I won't tell you what they call that mustache. But anyway, uh, nonetheless, you know, I lamented for years as to why I wasn't getting married. I thought I had found the right Individual, obviously she didn't think she found the right individual. But that was a, a sincere season of lament. You know, Lord, why? What's going on? Uh, what am I not doing? What should I be doing? And then the other area uh, was when, uh, after my wife and I were married, we, our struggle, and many of you know, our struggle with infertility and trying to have a baby naturally. 
I mean, I'd worked in a university, people. I heard one too many stories about Juno. We did it just once, and now we're pregnant. And I'm like, I find that hard to believe. For those of you who have struggled with infertility, you've done it more than just once. And you've done it with the aid of medication and with x-rays and with surgeries and still no child. You know, thousands and thousands of dollars later, it's like no baby. And so that, that was a season of lament. I would have to leave, leave the church I was at. I wasn't a pastor then. Uh, when they did baby dedications or baby baptisms, it was just too painful. Because I, in my mind, I'm thinking some of these parents don't even deserve to have a kid. Let's be honest. <laughs> and yet we wanted a child so bad, and yet... No child, even after they put three embryos back into Bonnie. It was just a few months before I went to seminary, and I thought, oh, if I'm going to be a dad of triplets, Ryan and Hartley, hats off to you with twins. But I thought if I was going to be a dad for triplets, I was going to uh, withdraw from seminary. Some of you were thinking, rats, too bad he didn't have... Uh, triplets, he wouldn't be here today. Who knows what would have happened? But I do know that uh, that didn't happen. And so, but what I also know is what is even more important, that we never would have discovered the blessing of, our, of adopting Mackenzie. We brought her home the day after she was born, and she is our precious daughter and our gift from, from God. And yet, in the middle of the journey Sincerely, folks, I was lamenting as to why this wasn't happening. I was 33. I saved myself until marriage. I should have had a baby like on a honeymoon night. It should have been a Mary and Joseph scene, number two. But still, no baby. And yet, in it all, there is indeed God's faithfulness. And even as that song we sang earlier, and I don't know about you, but when I sing these songs, it's like my mind runs through the tapes of my life. For those of you who are not old enough, tapes are something that you recorded things on years ago. But those tapes would go, uh, those tapes just go through my mind as I sing these songs of praise and of worship. And I know that some of you are lamenting today. And that's okay. That's healthy. That's how God has wired us. Oh, you may look good on the outside. Oh, you may have a great job and a wonderful car. Your family may look just picture perfect for everybody else. But there is something inside where you are just questioning in all sincerity and asking God, what? is the deal with this. Again, you feel like David as he was crying out again in verse one, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will I hide, how long will you hide your face from me? Again, people, your, your seasons, seasons of lament are healthy and normal and God welcomes your laments. So let us go to verse two and continue to see how David works through his experience. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? David was dwelling on his feelings and his problems. He was focused on the downside of his situation. And in our own uh, situation, we forget. We forget the reality of God's presence. And it is very easy to slip into a, a season of discouragement or even a season of depression. David's depressed. 
because of his relationship with God. He wasn't feeling that God was present. He was feeling that God was absent. He was feeling that God was ghosting him. David was depressed because in his processing, he was processing all himself. He kept playing the tapes over and over in his own mind. He was dwelling on it versus asking God more about it. And finally, he was concerned that his enemies might be successful over him. He continued to worry. And I tell you, folks, it's the what ifs that are damaging. It's the what ifs that can take your faith down a bad rabbit trail. What if? What if? What about this? What if that happens? What about this? What am I going to do? What, what, what? And that's where David uh, was focused on. He is feeling and he is behaving in ways that just contributed to really a depression. Now, James Montgomery Boyce says there are several potential sources of a spiritual depression. One is that your temperament. You're just wired that way. Maybe you are wired about the what ifs in life and you are just what if, what if, what if, what if. Maybe you have an illness and it's in our illnesses that can drain all of our energy, our physical energy and even our emotions. And we just don't have the energy to think clearly or the energy to fight off some false truths that are happening. Then that can lead us to depression. I think if any of you have been sick, you know. You just don't have the energy. Maybe you're exhausted. Maybe you've worked so hard and you feel like, we've done it, bravo, this is done. And yet, uh, you feel alone. You're exhausted. And we all have our own self-made pity parties at times. Or finally, maybe you just had a huge letdown, emotional letdown. You bought the big house, yay! And now you're like, for the next 30 years? Or you got the new car. It smells great. It's spotless. The kids haven't been in it. Now for the next seven years, you got a payment that you're thinking, what was I drinking when I bought this thing? This is ridiculous. Or even more serious, how about a post-wedding, post-wedding depressions? You know, all this attention on a young couple, they get married, uh, done your yesterday's news, you know, no more attention about your big day and what's going to happen. And and even the very real postpartum depression. You've been carrying this baby for nine months and I have all these parties and everyone's so thankful before your baby, you had the baby and everybody's off to the next party. Then you add in the whole uh, hormone thing going on and no doubt uh, being let down, uh, having a huge letdown from emotional experience can really lead us to depression. And so what do we do? Well, in verses 3 and 4, David offers a prayer that is honest and recalls his, recalls his dependence on God. It's a pivotal prayer. I don't want to call it the pee-pee prayer because some of your minds would go to a bad place. But it's a pivotal prayer for us. Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes. Enlighten my eyes. Is it another way of saying that? Or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. David knew that even though uh, he felt a certain way, he cried out to God to, to open his eyes. Give me your spirit. Now, David was concerned that if he fell asleep, now if he fell asleep in the Lord, that he would have a spiritual death. And so he wanted his eyes open and he wanted to be alive so his enemies wouldn't win. And so again, in our lamenting people, even if we feel that God may not be listening, God wants us to cry out with everything that we have. 
God wants us to remember the basics uh, of, his, of our faith in him. Now, this passage also brings up that dirty word in churches. Seven letters. It's an it's a F word with seven letters, and it's feeling. See, some of us don't like that word feeling. Some of us try to ignore it completely. And yet our feelings are an expression of God's image in us. God has created us. Some people ignore feelings, and they, want, uh, and they will want nothing to do. They say their feelings have nothing to do with who God is. Maybe it's just what they ate that day. And I will say, if we ignore our feelings, we are, being, uh, we are shortchanging how God has created us. God created us to feel anger. And at times, yes, there is a righteous anger. And at times, you may be angry, and that's okay. God has created us to have these, these feelings of anger and love and care and joy and sorrow and compassion. We're made in the image of God, and so he's given us these feelings. Our feelings are a gift. And so to ignore them or to say they don't exist is really, again, shortchanging who God is and how God has created you and me. Again, feelings have their place. And our feelings need to be checked with reality often. And that's why community is so important. Because you can run those feelings past people who love you, people who want to point you toward Jesus. And you can process those feelings with those people who care about you. And then you uh, have the other side where, uh, where people just run everything their whole life by feelings. Those of you who are old enough, what's that song? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. You know, feelings, feelings, feelings. And they're just not stable people. Well, okay, so I tipped my hat toward that. You know, you need to process those feelings. Don't ignore them, but don't let your life be uh, ran by them completely. Because as we know, our feelings, our feelings can often uh, be jolted by some false information. So our feelings, and they're impacted. I mean, our feelings are impacted by our own humanness. Yes, I will be probably more sensitive and tender to people who are single parents. I will feel more, more sensitivity toward maybe somebody who's lost a loved one. Maybe toward somebody who's struggled with infertility. It's just a part of who I am and how God has created me. But our feelings are just influenced by our experiences in life. So it was really all right for David to feel those feelings that God is absent. It's all right for him to, it's natural and it's normal and it's healthy for him to go to God with his feelings. And we need to model the same uh, behavior uh, when it comes to dealing with our own feelings. We really need to take them to the Lord we need to run the past God's word, do an effect check there on what we're feeling versus reality. And then again, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we need to be in community with other people that can help guide us uh, through our feelings. Paul reminds us about this in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. I keep asking that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope in which he has called you, the riches of his glory's inheritance in his holy people. That we use wisdom. That we pray that our eyes will be opened. And again, in our lamenting, in our time when we are feeling that God is silent, let's remember we need that reality check. Let us remember that we've been created by God, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and to ask God to open up our, the eyes of our heart 
to open up the eyes of our mind so that we can check our feeling against the truth of his word, so that we can check our feelings against really what is happening around us. And we see that. We see that what David writes in verses uh, five and six of how, that we, of how we can process in a healthy way our feelings. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Friends, David's pivot is, is formed by having a heart of gratitude. And no doubt, the remedy of some of our lamenting happens as we remind ourselves of the goodness of God. Because when reality hits, all of our attention, our energy, and our emotion is in that situation, forgetting the whole reality of what God has done for us and how he wants us to live our lives and what he has already done for us. That's as we praise God, as we have a heart of gratitude, we see that God can miraculously remove our fears, that God can put things into perspective, that God brings us some answers, and that we are reminded that our hope is in our Lord. And again, I, I want to be sure here not to, to minimize your pain and sorrow, and that all you got to do is say, praise Jesus, and, you know, move on with your life. That isn't the heart of what I'm sharing today. but it's to uh, be honest with God. It's to recognize your feelings, but don't build the foundation of your life on your feelings. Build the foundation on, of your life on the God's word and his son and the community that he has blessed you with. And again, I can't write this, I can't study this for hours and not think of, a couple of verses here. One is Romans 5, 3 and 5. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We all have or we all will suffer heartache and disappointments. There's nothing in scripture that says because we open our eyes to Jesus we can skip all the painful experiences in life. Yet a part of who we are needs to be again on that foundation of who Jesus is. And the way to take slow steps at times, maybe, is to, again, create a heart of gratitude in your own life. Again, Paul wraps it up this way in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say that life will be perfect. But it says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Yep, we're going to feel at times that God is ghosting us. So let us rely on God's word on God's people, and let us create even more a holy habit that in everything, by prayer and thanksgiving, let us make our requests known to God. And then again, as I just read, and as David ends the psalm, I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Let's pray. Thank you for being a God who hears our concerns and our praises. 
Thank you for welcoming our questions, Lord, and helping us to figure out life. We thank you for your word that points us to you. We thank you for community that brings us close to you. And we thank you that we can sing praises to you for all you have been and all that you have done for us. And God's people said,